I've titled the message this morning as we kick off this series, Luke's Literature. And we'll be looking at the first four verses. And um, I was in the study this past week reading about a small bookstore. I'm always interested. There's very few bookstores left. Uh, you know, the kind of bookstores uh, that have the cat. Uh, the pet cat and the, the spider webs in the corner. I like those kind of bookstores. Those are hard to find. But there, there is one in um, South Dakota, and I'm not going to drive that far just to go there. But on the sign of the front of the bookstore, uh, here's what the sign said. Read a good novel, quote, before Hollywood ruins it. How true is that? And the world, though, is full of novels. A lot of people don't like to read uh, books are a scarce thing and um, you know there's the world's full of novels and good literature and, and good books some are compelling literature some are moving some are impactful books are a very powerful thing they are why well because books can change the way that you think and books can change the way that you live I agree with Erasmus an old wise theologian who said this quote when I have a little money I buy books and if I have any money left he says I buy food and clothing now you know that you're a book nerd or book worm when you study the origin of books where do books come from that's one of those moments it was like okay man you are really geeking out on this book stuff when you study where books come from, the origin of books even finds its origin back into past civilizations and Greek gods. YouTube on free movies, if you're wanting to watch a good novel movie, uh, Beowulf is now free on YouTube. Everybody's up for a good dragon slayer movie. Shakespeare, or what about the philosophy of Herman Meville's Moby Dick? A lot of good novels. Those are good, but there is one enduring true story that towers above them all the 23 20th century Hollywood got it right actually when they came out with the movie of retelling the life of Christ the greatest story ever told that's free on YouTube right now shockingly the greatest story ever told it is they at least they got that right the greatest story is that God's exhaustive divine foreknowledge, that God's predetermined plan from the beginning has been to rescue lost sinners from eternal hell. The gracious and loving plan of God is that Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for sin and all those who are in Jesus Christ. Here's what John wrote concerning him. 1 John 2, 2, he himself is the propitiation. What's that Bible word mean? Don't say atoning sacrifice. That kind of puts a soft kiss on it. Say what it is, a wrath averted sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Yeah, that's the greatest story ever told because that's how God demonstrated his righteousness. Why? Because all have fallen short of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? It manifested in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The central theme of this book is the Old Testament and the New Testament, the scarlet thread of salvation which weaves through all 66 inspired, inerrant, indestructible books. The common thread is Jesus Christ. No other literature I believe in the Bible clearly focuses on that life and on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ with such accurate, comprehensive, diligent detail than I believe the gospel according to Luke. And therefore I invite you to join me to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well 
having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Verse 4. So that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Let's pray. And we are thankful, Father, for such a time as this to come together on this Lord's Day, the market day of the soul, to be equipped, to be encouraged, to be uplifted, to be affirmed, to be convicted, to be challenged, to be strengthened, most importantly, to be equipped through truth, historical truth that corresponds to reality, the Lord Jesus Christ, the essence of truth, and we ask and we pray, Father, that you would give us such diligent detail with precision this morning to be laser focused upon your word, the timeless truths, the precious promises from old, that our lives, that our hearts, that our wills, that our motives would be more and more conformed into the image of Christ. And it's in his sinless, eternal name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> a brief introduction would be necessary probably. Interestingly enough, these four verses are one sentence in the Greek. Yeah. Long sentence. We would call that a run-on. <laughs> Very powerful. Looking at the book of Luke... Exegetical commentaries, not the ones that are like sermons, but the, but the real commentaries, the exegetical ones which break down each Greek word. A, a lot of those have a portion of notes about that, uh, extensive portion of notes just on the book of Luke. So the, the teacher or the preacher's job is therefore to read all of that and then to condense all that down to just very quick points. It's not necessarily easy to do, but I'm going to attempt it here as by way of introduction. This history here covers about 60 years combining Luke and Acts together. It's a lot of history there of the life of Christ into the Acts of the Apostles ending with Paul's first imprisonment. Luke's gospel is the longest gospel with 1,151 verses. It's very unique um, because there is 47 what I'm going to call special texts within Luke that are not mentioned in any of the other Gospels. That tells us something right from jump. Another thing that's interesting is, is that this is the most polished Greek in the New Testament. You say, well, it's all Greek to me. Well, really it's not because all of the Greek in the New Testament is what's called Koine Greek, which means common Greek, not Luke's. Luke writes in what's called classical Greek, not common Greek. Um, the book of Hebrews is actually written close to classical Greek, which is why a lot of people believe that Luke could be the author for Hebrews, um, but it's uncertain. The point is, this is the most intense Greek in the New Testament, the book of Luke. And um, as we're going to see, Luke's literature is very serious literature. And um, with that being said, I think that even the most sophisticated pagan or even the most sophisticated Gentile would appreciate Luke's literature for what it is. He's very well educated and he was a Gentile author and writing to Gentile reader. But that's a precis. Latin term precis means cut it short. So there's your cut short overview of the book. And uh, in regards to the person, the book, point one, point two, the person. And that's the beauty of expository preaching, which is what you're getting here, uh, verse by verse, unleashing God's truth, one verse at a time. And in doing so, what we find, I believe, in, in this text, there's one meaning for each unit of Scripture, but we can find different application through the Scriptures as well. But with that being said, um, the text, 
actually gives us information about the identity of Luke, and, and that seems to be rather explicit and explicit. And what do you mean by implicit? Well, it's implied. This is implied within the text, and, and in that it's a, it's, a, it's a conclusion which seems to result from logic. Something that could be missing in our culture today because a lot of times people don't want to think for themselves, so they allow the culture or something to, to redefine logic for them. I can give you one example of that. This isn't in the notes, but, but like, for example, someone that might say, well, guns kill people. Well, you know, no, they don't. The people kill people, right? So guns don't kill people. That's what we're saying by redefining logic for us. We've got to be thinkers of our own selves. And in looking at the text, we see that there's some implicit things that are implied and, and explicit things that are implied. And that's the practices, friend. That's the principles of what's called, big word, don't tune me out, discourse analysis. When we study the Bible, we need to be looking at these kind of things. So anyways, wow. Moving on. Stay with me. Two points. That's all you get. Can you believe it? Two points today. You say, well, it'll still be an hour and a half sermon. Well, it is what it is. And I assure you, it won't be no hour and a half. Point one, deriving from the text, Luke, the physician and the historian. So how do you know Luke wrote the book? Well, look at verse 3. There's an object pronoun in verse 3. It seemed fitting for me as well. Seems to me to be a reference to the author. Don't you say? Well, what do you know about the author? Colossians 4.14 is what we know about the author. Paul referred to his friend Luke as a beloved physician. Here is where you and I need to be careful, though, and not read the Bible in what I call American goggles or Western goggles. Because a physician in the ancient world didn't really mean or carry the weight. Eh, maybe weight's not a good word. Maybe the dignity of how the profession carries dignity today. For example, a helpful historian uh, pulling down off the shelf, uh, Howard C. Key, gives some helpful perspective in regards to the physicians in the ancient world. Here's what he said, quote, It's evident that the medical profession was regarded as being characteristically greedy and fond of public display. Plutarch says and mocks the smooth bedside manner of the day, Diochristodem describes the efforts of physicians to drum up trade by public lecture presentations intended to dazzle hearers and attract patients, close quote. Hmm, that's interesting. Yet John Scarborough in his Roman medicine survey said this, quote, notes that there were two different types of physicians in these days serving two different groups of patients. The aristocrats had physicians as servants or as private employees in their own establishments or had excesses to them despite their high fees and lofty reputations. There were also many illiterate doctors, and quacks, and charlatans. There's still some today, by the way. Gullible and needy public, close quote. That's interesting. Now, in the New Testament... There is an interesting thing that occurs here because physician in the Greek word is hierotros. I found seven references in the New Testament for that word, and guess what? Only one time in those references was it used in a positive sense. Six of them were in a negative sense. So the historians were probably right. Most doctors in the ancient days were quacks. Maybe, maybe not much has changed. The only positive appearance of a physician in the Bible is Colossians 4, 14. And it reads, Luke, the beloved physician. Very interesting. That word beloved in its context literally points to piety and integrity. 
Wow. That just opened up Pandora's box, didn't it? Physician. Jerome said this, quote, This physician, Luke, a physician of bodies to a physician of souls, whose writings are divine prescriptions written to men. That's true. A lot of Old Testament scriptures, descriptive, it's describing, but this is what we're going to see in the gospel according to Luke, is that most of the writings are prescriptive scripture, something that we must go and do and fill if we are going to be well. At the very beginning of Luke's book, though, he has acknowledged that, here you go, many others had already undertaken to compile an account of the life of Jesus. That's interesting to think about and contemplate. He doesn't really list who. I'm sure many were lost. But the inspired letters of Matthew and Mark were already written before Luke took up the pen. We know that Luke had personal contact with Matthew and Mark, and we know that Mark and Luke were both ministry partners and traveled with Paul. Luke could have uh, visited Matthew in the, the Jerusalem church during Paul's two-year imprisonment at Caesarea in Acts 24, 27. And um, it's interesting to think about that. And Luke could have interviewed individuals that were part of that Jerusalem church who actually knew, knew the Lord. Uh, really? Yeah. I mean, think about it. And then that would also include, um, don't forget this, uh, Jesus, Jesus' mother Mary. I'm blessed, thankful that my mother's here this morning. I guess if you wanted to know the most about me, she would be the one to talk to, don't you say? And that's interesting too to think about because who gives the, the, the most descriptive narrative of Jesus' birth? Not Matthew, not Mark, not John, Luke. And then all the women. Luke emphasizes all the women who were a part of the ministry of Jesus more so than any other gospel writer. And then he would have had access then to the 120 gathered in the Jerusalem following the ascension, Acts 115. But most importantly, man, he would have had access to all the 500 individuals. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus was seen for a period of 40 days. Over 500 different people. Here you go, young people. Here's an apologetic moment. If this is just a big bedtime story or lie, then how come we have no historical documents of any of these 500 people or anyone that says that it was a lie? Instead, we have the complete opposite. We have pagans and atheists even acknowledging the historical accuracy and the historical truth claims of the Word of God. 500 people saw him in his bodily resurrected form, 1 Corinthians 15:6. They would have vividly remember, remembered the things that Jesus said. They would have vividly remembered the things that Jesus done. They could have interviewed, Luke could have interviewed him. Okay, well, that's interesting. Well, Luke wasn't interested in a bedtime story or even just writing a little biography of Jesus. No, much more than that. Because if there's anyone that emphasizes the central mission of Jesus, it's Luke. And that story is what God has done to save sinners. Look at verse 1 of your Bible. One word, accomplished. See that in verse 1? Accomplished. Literally, indicates a fulfillment. Wow, that tells us something. Real quick then, doesn't it? Just by that one word that this is a fulfillment, that this isn't some story, that this isn't some autobiography or even some academic guru. No, no relevance. Well, well Jesus is more. That There was an accomplishment here, and Luke emphasizes that, that Jesus was more than a life coach. Jesus is more than some just ethical good teacher. He's more than a social justice revolutionary or guru. He's not some just selfless model of humility. He's not a nursing home activity director. He's not your co-pilot. He's not your dream weaver. He's not your drug sponsor. He is Jesus Christ, God incarnate, John 1.29, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Satan would love nothing more for our culture to water him down just to be something he's not he accomplished in verse 1 Luke was not critical about anyone who had written any other documents about Jesus he says in verse 1 that he's just simply undertaken to compile an account rich rich words really referring to a historical writing of Jesus's life and ministry he's not even really correcting anyone else but under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit what Luke is doing is he's raising the bar because he's the only one that adds a sequel onto the gospel called Acts this word undertaken in your Greek you're never going to believe what this means taking up the pen look it up for yourself imagine that Luke raises the bar by adding the sequel that's beautiful because we have to have the Christology the person and work of Christ before we have the doctrine of ecclesiology the church Christology before ecclesiology a lot of similarities between Luke and Acts Jesus goes about healing so does Peter and Paul Jesus had his face set like a flint to go to Jerusalem Paul had his face set like a flint to go to Rome Jesus was oppressed and murdered Stephen was oppressed and murdered a lot of similarities all based on empirical evidence anyone that tells you in the public school system that if you can't see it hear it touch it taste it or smell it it doesn't exist they're lying to you how do you know then that Abraham Lincoln penned the Gettysburg Address were you there no but you believe it why because there was eyewitness testimony of someone that was there therefore you believe history so too in the Bible your Bible says that there was eyewitnesses the most significant sources are eyewitnesses unlike the Muslim Quran which was written hundreds and hundreds of years later not by eyewitnesses that'd be like us witnessing a wreck out here and then the police coming and getting these two young girls as information here who witnessed the wreck that's reliable testimony because they were eyewitnesses but then 400 500 years later someone steps on the scene and they act like they know what happened no it's logically absurd now Luke some would say what well, will Luke wasn't an apostle okay that's true he wasn't he didn't meet the qualification of an apostle to be an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ but however like Mark he was not himself one of their number but was he a companion absolutely and that's what he says we were servants of the word most notably a companion of the Apostle Paul so with all of this access with all of these eyewitness testimonies with all of the books with all of the pens with all of the documents with all of the first-hand knowledge verse 3 look what he says it was fitting this was not enough for me just to set back and sit on it the fitting the good the proper for him to write the account notice the phrase here he investigated everything carefully from the beginning having had perfect understanding the Greek reads of all things from the very first how much more fitting for you and I in a day and age where commentaries and books are rampant how much more fitting is it for us to be doing the work of the Lord <clears throat> these remarks though are made by an accurate historian in careful thorough research and Luke was giving a very unique precise understanding of Jesus's life what can we glean here is this just application or just data dump stuff no because th there is some things that we can glean in regards to a balance of what we've learned so far 
What we've learned so far is that there's a balance between the Spirit's inspiration over here, but the text is showing us the person of Luke, so therefore the Spirit's illumination here, but, but also the personality of Luke over here. There's a balance. So the Spirit is using Luke's knowledge and now honestly giving him additional info and adding to, but, but the Spirit was controlling every word. The Spirit through Luke wrote every word that God wanted written. And therefore we can conclude that, that this is inspired from God. God breathed and it's inerrant. It's without any error. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 20 through 21 says this, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. I was reading J.C. Ryle's book this past week, The Old Paths. Chapter 1 was on the inspiration of the Word of God, and here's what Ryle said. Inspiration, in short, is the very keel and foundation of Christianity. If Christians have no divine book to turn to as the warrant of their doctrine and practice, they have no solid ground to present peace or hope, and they have no right to claim the attention of mankind. They are building on a quicksand, and their faith is vain. Ryle says we ought to be able to say boldly, we are what we are, we do what we do, because here, friends, we have a book which we believe to be the very word of God. Close quote. Talking about the balance of inspiration and the personality of Luke, we have to back up a little bit because there's really been two historical developments that have really stood behind the attack of the doctrine of inspiration of Scripture. Number one, we go back to the 16th century of the Protestant Reformation. It is there that the, they asserted the biblical authority over and against the Roman Catholic Church and popes and princes and councils. And they coined a phrase in Latin called sola scriptura. It's more than something cute you see on a bumper sticker or a t-shirt. It was something that the reformers and the Puritans sealed their blood on. They died for it. No other regime other than the communist and Roman Catholic regime has murdered more Christians than anyone else in the entire world. It's true. Bloody Mary, Queen Mary, murdered many, 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 many Puritans that took a stand for the authority of Scripture. The second historical development, though, was the rise of liberalism. That was in the 16th century. Now we back up to about the late 18th century, crossing the Atlantic from Germany. Here they come, buddy. The major ideology and philosophy changes that took place, particularly starting within the academic world. And by the 1800s, everyone seemed to capitulated their theology, the burning flame of the Reformation coming to an end. Francis Schaeffer, in reading his book this past week on the watching world, he got it right. He talked about the reoccurring cycle of history, and Francis Schaeffer says this, quote, living orthodoxy moves to dead orthodoxy, from dead orthodoxy to heterodoxy. What's he saying? He's saying that once you're right on, and you begin to fall into a state of complacency. It's then that liberalism is just crouching at the door. And once you go there, you never go back. It's easy to be at the right and go left, but once you go left, it's impossible almost to go back to the right. Relevance, what about Luke? Well, we see the balance of the Spirit's inspiration, but also the personality of Luke. Therefore, the Bible, just like our Lord Jesus Christ, is truly divine, but it's also truly man. That's right. That's right. Point number two. Luke was also a theologian and what I'm going to call a shepherd. He says, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, Well, Dwayne was talking about asking God for things this morning. 
I've asked the Lord to make me a theologian. You know, I've gotten a lot of attack from that, not anyone here. Who do you think you are, a theologian? Why is it okay for individuals in an AA meeting to sit and call themselves an addict when they've never even done drugs, but it's not okay to call ourselves theologians if we're Christians? The world will accept you if you're an addict, still calling yourself an addict. Hi, I'm Bill, I'm an addict. No, you're not. We need to be theologians too. Analytical, logical, systematic, precise, accurate, organized, inquisitive, with a goal to persuade people to understand doctrine and that the understanding of the doctrine is more than an academic knowledge of some Bible college, but the understanding of doctrine inflaming the heart, equipping the mind, and inflaming the heart. Without the inflaming of the heart, we're a bunch of eggheads. But without the mind, it turns into first Christian circus show. Many churches that only have the mind are like a funeral home. Many churches that only have the heart are like a circus. But when you have the mind and the heart combined, and then the will is activated, that's like being on the beach. You get everything. Just, it's all good. I don't know. I'm not very good at illustrations. But what I am good at is unleashing the text because verse 3, Luke was a master theologian because look at this, three words. In consecutive order, chronology beginning to end. Simple enough. He starts with the birth of Christ as Jesus' circumcision, Jesus' boyhood, Jesus' baptism, Jesus' public ministry, the cross, and the resurrection. So what? Well, here you go. What you see in Luke is, is the logic on fire, as Lloyd-Jones called it. But because you see the doctrine, <clears throat> the theology, <clears throat> all flowing out of chronology. <clears throat> so it's not just a list of names. It's passion and doctrine and theology. And I can't stress it enough, this artistic arrangement in his words in, in verses 4. Mickey's King James, New King James, he likes the New King James, and, and Mickey's New King James says an orderly account, right, brother? Yeah. That's wonderful. It captures the essence of it, don't it? His goal was to persuade. So there you go. There's your bullseye. It's not just idling, babbling. There was a persuasion to lead the readers to believe the gospel, carefully research logical, systematical presentation of truth. What do you mean theological? Well, the first theological truth we see is that God's sovereignty is in history. Prove it. The sequel, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, 22 through 24, in Peter's sermon, when Luke documents, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan, hello, and foreknowledge, hello, of God. You nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death, but God raised him up again putting the end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to behold his power. Second theological truth Luke conveys is that redemption is for everyone. Once again in the sequel, Acts chapter 10, he documents Acts chapter 10, that the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. 10, 34, opening his mouth, Peter, he was good at that. I most certainly understand now that, that God is not one to show partiality. Peter was very racist. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Wow, Luke's going to convey all that. Jesus is for everyone. Salvation is made available for all. Luke himself being a Gentile. Out of all the gospel writers, and Luke makes this case. Not to mention he wrote to Theophilus, who was also a Gentile. And Luke expresses it all with detail that the gospel is for all ethnic groups. 
The gospel is for Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles. And then Luke even is the one that, that lo locates these categories of individuals more so than any other author because Luke includes the women, prostitute women, outcasts, including lepers. Matthew really doesn't even mention any of those, okay? But, uh, Luke mentions uh, uh, the possession by demons and tax collectors more so than, than any others. The, the universal gospel through Jesus, not that everybody's saved, but he died for everybody, man. Rather they receive him or not. Unlike Matthew from Abraham to Jesus genealogy, Luke gives a genealogy in Luke 3 from Adam to Jesus. Everybody. Third theological truth was what I call Luke's tender concern for lost sinners. Because he's the only one in Luke 15 that gives the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son emphasizing that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who comes to repentance, right? The doctrine of salvation. Fourth theological truth, the cross. Luke emphasizes the cross more so than anyone else because from Luke chapter 9, guess what? To Luke chapter 23, it's all about the cross. Once again, from Luke 9 to Luke 23, that's a theological truth. As you're catching up writing, I'll give some quotes about the cross because that's the greatest question that you and I could ever ask ourselves. Young people, old people, the majority here of 10 church, baptized into Christ, profess to call ourselves Christians, but the question is, what do we think and feel about the cross? That's the most important question that we'll ever ask ourselves. Quoting Ryle again, he said, quote, You may know a good deal about Christ by a kind of head knowledge. You may know who he was, where he was born, what he did. You may know Bible trivia. You may know his miracles, his sayings, his prophecies, his ordinances. You may know how he lived, how, how he suffered, how he died. But Ryle says, but unless one knows the power of Christ's cross by experience, unless you know and feel within that the blood shed on the cross was washed away by your own particular sins, unless you're willing to confess and believe it or not, guess what he says, and be baptized. Not all are against us, folks. That your salvation depends entirely on the work that Christ did upon the cross. Unless this be the case, Christ, he says, will profit you nothing. The mere knowing Christ's name, he said, will never save you. You must know his cross and his blood or else you'll die in your sins, close quote. Luke's final message, though, reveals what I'm going to call the heart of a shepherd the heart of a minister, the heart of a deacon. Really? Yeah. As great as this literature is, man, wonderful, artistic, beautiful words and eloquent. One thing that I've never thought about until a repetition of the text this past week is Luke has the heart of a shepherd. Why? Because he addresses this massive work to one individual. Verse 3. Most excellent Theophilus. What do you know about him? No clue. Regarding details. most excellent um, if I had to say would probably guess to someone uh, referring to someone of prominence because in Luke's sequel uh, he writes about the governor Felix most excellent Felix in uh, Acts 23 26 and I think again in Acts 24 um, verses 3 or 4 It seems though Theophilus had been taught certain things, but 
some of that had been kind of unclear and some of it had been incomplete. So Luke comes back and he says in verse 4, paraphrasing, okay, man, yeah, but, but I want you to know the exact truth. And the word exact, and that's the cool thing about your study notes in front of you, is you can circle words over here because you've got enough margin space on your left side, and then you can take notes on your right side, so you can circle that word exact on your left side because literally it means reliable. It means certain and accurate. So what Luke is saying here is not that Matthew isn't accurate because it's inspired too, not that Mark isn't accurate because it's inspired too, but man, Luke is saying, okay, I, but get ready. Buckle your pew. Buckle your seatbelt, Luke says, because we're going higher. Wow. Why the intensity? Because that's exciting. That's the true leader in the Lord's church. That's the true elder. That's the true deacon. That's the true minister. One that is not content with mediocre. One that is not content with doing church. But one that is only satisfied. His only disposition is to raise the bar at the first Christian church of Peakneyville. And that whatever was done before is not acceptable. It's always been this way. If, we don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, it may not be broke yet. But with that attitude, it's about to be broke. Because we're going to raise the bar. Amen? Amen? Executing our duty, not filling offices. We raise the bar here. We take it to the next level. And we keep marching like we've never marched before. Because I'm here to tell you, man, the more evil the times, the holier the church ought to be. Everybody else is loosening their grip, compromising, bending the knee to government and state authorities, and the church needs to stand her ground. We show respect, but we stand our ground. The heart of a shepherd? To motivate and raise the bar. But the second aspect of the heart of Luke, and the shepherds, the deacons, the preachers, all of us, all gay, all of us. But you get the point. To care about one Theophilus. He cared enough about one Theophilus's soul that made this spirit empowered effort to bring this one man precise, accurate knowledge of truth concerning Jesus Christ. One man. All this work for one. That's the danger of likes and shares that does not define success in ministry. Maybe in a secular business, but not in the Lord's church because we do it for one. I don't care if there was one like, we would still record, we would still write, we would still preach. This attitude of, well, you don't have to put in that much work because on Sunday night there's only five that show up. No, that's great motivation to do that much even more work for those five because those five that only showed up could possibly be the ones that are even more committed. And look at what God did. A book written by one man distributed folks around the entire world. And this is the physician. This is the historian. This is the theologian. And this is the shepherd. And invite you to be introduced to Luke. A wonderful privilege to be an instrument by God to equip Christians all around the world. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your written word. What exciting, exciting things. We love our church here, Lord, but most important, we love, we love you because you spilt your blood for us. You've given us your church. You're the architect. You're the builder. We just are thankful to be a part of it. 
Lord, we know that there's not anything perfect here, that we are all stumblers and mess up all the time. But we are so thankful, Father, for the men, the women here within this church. And we pray, we pray just now, Father, that fresh commitments could be made to turn our eyes back to you, Father. That in light of our families and our busy schedules and our busy, busy, busy days, our simple prayer, Father, is that you would give us a burning flame, a deeper commitment to Christ, and that we too could be like Luke and that would raise the bar. In Jesus' name, amen.